Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today we're going to finish our conversation with Andrew Whitstead of Heavy Board, the podcast that is heavy and bored. Today, you're going to hear where the name came from if you haven't figured it out yet. Um, real quick, let me just go through some of the topics we're going to hit. We're going to talk the beats, the modernists, Kurt Cobain, David Foster Wallace, Sylvia Plath, the confessional poets, Robert Lowell, Poetry Foundation, Frank O'Hara, Elizabeth Bishop, Hemingway, Ken Burns, Stephen King, Playboy, reading poetry digitally, John Berryman, James Joyce, and the White Stripes, and much more shit. So that's really exciting. I'm going to tell you a little something here, everyone. I had a pretzel that was chocolate covered covered pretzel. I dipped it in peanut butter, okay? And then I dropped it on the floor. Didn't have my glasses on. I picked it up, looked at it, and it looked okay. I blew on it, and then I ate it. Ever since then, I've had hair in my mouth, sand in my mouth, rocks in my mouth. It's like burning the roof of my mouth. It's gone up into my sinuses, burning my sinuses, and now everything smells like chocolate. I, I'm... It's been two hours, and I don't know what to do. I've flushed my sinuses. I've taken pills. I've squirted stuff. I'm having a complete breakdown over something so stupid. Like, why do you eat stuff off the ground? The five-second rule doesn't work on food that's wet or sticky. What am I fucking doing, dude? So anyway, let's talk about things that we need to talk about. So we are getting terrifyingly close to episode 100, where I want you guys to record your questions and send them in to me so I can play your lovely voices on the show. So get your questions in, send them to IHateMattWallGmail.com. As of recording this, tonight we are going to be having the premiere of Drinking Less, my new chapbook, the audiobook, the print book, and the ebook all at once. It's 7 o'clock tonight on here on July 21st. I don't think this episode's coming out until the following Tuesday, so there's that. But also, since um, this is coming out on Tuesday, that means yesterday, from the future, now that you're hearing this, my video called is Ocean Vong Good is out on my YouTube channel where I play a reading from Ocean Vong and critically analyze it to answer the age-old question, is Ocean Vong good? So that's something interesting for all of you poetry schlubs out there. I've also put out videos on why you struggle to write poetry, the two mistakes new poets make all the time, how to have better poetry readings, things of that nature. So there's all sorts of good shit. And then I think I, by the time you hear this, the last episode of the podcast that is about bullying and cancel culture um, has gone out. And I don't know if there's an, an episode following this one, you know, that I didn't piss off everyone to where they came after me. So that's good. Also, for um, anyone who is interested, I am trying to build up my Instagram because I've had it for a long time. I just don't really do a whole lot with it. And then somebody who hit me up after hearing me on Poetry Says came and like we had a talk and this person has been following me on Instagram for a long time, but had no idea about my podcast and my YouTube channel. So the fact that that happened means that I have completely dropped the fucking ball over on the grams. So um, I'm trying to work on that. And again, if you are on Instagram, I am I hate Matt Wall or Poetic Anarchy Press. Both of those are up there. But what I was going to ask you is if you are a listener of this show or you follow me on YouTube, if there are any like clips that you think are great that I should be pushing out that are just like little clips for reels or shorts or whatever, let me know what those are or send me the clips. I would love to start um, doing more shit like that. So definitely do that. Um, on the Bukowski Book Club this week, we did um, we did Crucifix and a Death Hand from Burning and Water, Drowning in Flame. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Oh, and I also did 
a sort of like it's not really a commentary track because there wasn't a whole lot to say about it but we watched it and i talked of the taylor hackford 1973 documentary called bukowski so that should be up on my youtube channel as well here pretty soon so if you haven't yet you need to go over and sub to heavy board there should be an episode or two with me on his show coming here pretty soon here is my talk with andrew psychology behind advertising i do love a lot of the art of advertising yeah i love a lot of that but for uh, real I don't know. I mean, I think it just does overshadow what we're trying, like the art itself, right? So if we're obsessed with the politics or the political trend around where the art was created, well, now we're not focusing enough attention on the actual piece of art, you know, whether that's a book, poem, you know, movie, painting, whatever it is, you know, music. So so do you think um, if like the modernists weren't the modernists, that their stuff would have been as, I don't know, exciting to people when it was if the fucking um i don't know if the beats weren't the beats would anyone even fucking know who the hell they were today yeah i mean there's a lot to be said for attitude there's a lot to be said for you know the romanticizing that a lot of writers can't even control that just kind of happens around you yeah uh but I think the I would my guess is you know you all your all my professors in college I'm sure a lot of people felt have found this is they're obsessed with the modernists. Why are they obsessed with the modernists? Well, that was really like the last big, very interesting movement where these people were they were trying shit like they were yeah. experimenting with things. They were taking it to the limit. You know, Virginia Woolf, like these stream of consciousness writers, they were. Mm they were doing something that no one had done before. Like it was, you know, and that's why I always get upset with the people say everything's been done. No, it hasn't. You know, no modernist writer was thinking uh-huh. that they were like, I'm going to change the fucking game and I'm going to try to do it. Maybe it fails. Maybe it doesn't work, but at least trying to go for it creates a creative, like a really good place like for creativity to flourish. And I think the modernists show how you do that. Like you can, change the entire understanding of literature what it's capable of you know you don't mm-hmm. have to follow the formula you can do weird long tangent i guess the victorian writers did this too they're you know those huge behemoth books thousand page novels that were coming yeah. out but the modernist you know and that's what they always teach you in school they were obsessed with with making it new and then i think <clears throat> even though they were the hot writers at the time there's that kind of inevitable romanticizing after the fact where once, you know, 10, 20 years goes by, we can look back and be like, man, you know, that was really cool. Like that was actually really cool. And I think the same thing with the beats, like some people recognized it at the time, but it wasn't until like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years later, people were like, wait a minute, that was actually really cool. It's like like when all, when all the kids who were into the beats got jobs in Hollywood and we're executives now <laughs> they're like oh i can make a movie about this guy i liked you know and i don't know if that's what it takes like for the normies to get like jobs in media to be able to like talk about the shit they were into you know like i don't know but like when you were talking about that thing about um like the artists don't really have any control over it and since we were talking about kurt cobain earlier like that dude was just like i'm fucking depressed my life kind of sucks i wrote all these songs when my life was a fucking garbage pail and now like and i shop at a thrift store because i'm poor as fuck right and now you guys are turning it into like fashion and identity and all this other shit and he couldn't fucking handle it yeah you know like fuck that uh did did you watch that montage of heck uh the documentary that came uh-uh. out a couple years ago uh-uh. it's basically about it's like there were a couple documentaries that came out a few years ago it was like kurt and courtney and then there was like montage of heck i did see that one i did see and kurt and courtney montage of heck i think captured it kind of the best where his struggles with like what he was the selling out it's very gen x i feel like the selling mm-hmm. out factor and he said, you know, when they got successful, right, they made a lot of money off Nevermind. And he became a millionaire, could buy this mansion in Seattle, right? And like, 
I think Courtney Love bought like a BMW or something and like drove it home and he got like furious with her and told her to like return the car because they shouldn't be driving BMWs. And she's like, well, we're rich. Like, you know, like, and he was just so worried about people thinking that he sold out or that he wasn't in it for the music anymore. And I mean, he was doing a shitload of heroin too. So you can't rule that out. Like, you know, people don't do smart things (laughs) when they're addicted to heroin, but uh, yeah. And then, you know, he's been romanticized, too. If you die early, yeah, that helps. DFW, right? Like David Foster Wallace. And speaking of somebody who tried to push the limits, I'm not a huge David Foster Wallace fan, but I can respect that this guy was going balls to the walls, maximalist, like trying to do new techniques, the footnotes, you know, all that kind of crazy yeah. shit that he would do. And sometimes it doesn't work. Other times it does. But then him committing suicide i think really helped the reputation us at least for us to romanticize it as like this kind of oh this artist is different right artists are different than everybody else they're like yeah but in reality you know we're just people like <laughs> we just like that's what, like i stuff. i always wonder i'm like would anyone still know who sylvia plath was right like if she didn't do that you know are you a plath guy are you a fan or um i was much more of a fan like in college right. than I am now. Um, but I think that's just who I was at the time. Like it spoke to me more than, than now, you know, I, I mean the confessional poets I fucking love. So mm-hmm. uh, I love Plath, although I agree with you with this kind of her reputation would not be what it is if she didn't put her head in that oven kind yeah. of thing uh, yeah, at a young age uh, with her kids in the fucking house. But it was like, uh, I don't know. I always say she only wrote one book, right? Like she yeah. really only wrote one book of poetry uh, and it's quite good. She had very good teachers. You know, Lowell was one of her teachers at Harvard. Um, but there is this, I just got of, all pissed off at Lowell. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, I was no, no, listening no. to, um, do you ever listen to fucking poetry talk? Uh no, what is that? Is that a pod? It's like I'm I'm not kept up with any of it. Like when you were telling me about the what's his name the the other Slee guy, Ricketts, yeah. dude, you yeah, gotta yeah. listen to Slee Ricketts. I you did after it. you mentioned it. <laughs> you know, I'd never I'd never heard of it, but I looked yeah. it up when you emailed me. And I was like, oh yeah, I want to go. See. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, but I poetry talk is like it's um like in part with the Poetry Foundation. Oh okay okay. It's okay. like some dude and who works out of the poet's house in Pennsylvania or something like that. He gets poets together to like discuss poems or something like that. And they were going over Frank O'Hara's Lana Turner has collapsed. My favorite O'Hara poem. Yeah, yeah, for real. And the um, it's dirty was the other one. And these people were like arguing about the Lana Turner poem and I was getting really annoyed um, with how they were doing it. And then this woman who was there said that when, cause he wrote it on the ferry and then went to a poetry reading and then read the poem at the poetry reading and um, Lowell got fucking livid apparently right, yeah, yeah, that yeah. he did this. And started saying all the shit. So then I started writing, like, I wrote, like, three fucking poems cussing out Lowell. Like, how fucking dare you, sir? Don't fucking tell someone they can't fucking do something, you piece of shit. And I went through this whole fucking thing. And, um, but then I found out that, um, like, I listened to it again after I was, like, sober and not as angry as I was. Um, and they just said he would never read a poem that he wrote on the ferry. And right. I thought he was saying, like, don't write poems on the ferry. And I'm like, <laughs> And so I immediately jumped to conclusions and like start cussing out a dead guy. So yeah, that's, that's my life. Well, Lowell is, I think that it demonstrates the divide though, right. That I think you're, you're always talking about. And I, I talk about a little bit where there's the academic versus kind of this more street or poet for back yeah. of better, lack of a better word. And O'Hare was the type who, yeah, the, I do this, I do that formula, right. Where he was literally almost documenting his life, but dressing it up and making it quite funny. Usually yeah. too. Lana Turner's collapsed is hilarious poem. Yeah. Uh, but I think it does demonstrate this kind of Lowell is the type of guy, you know, he's not somebody that people get into right away. <laughs> he uh-huh. is very hard. Like he's, 
poetry, and I think this is why people either don't like it or reject it initially, is because poetry requires more of the reader than a lot of other art forms, right? It makes you dig a little bit. It makes you maybe look up stuff a little bit more. Like it just requires more participation from the reader than just reading it and enjoying it, you know? Mm -hmm. And Lowell is one that, you know, this guy, Boston Brahmin, you know, this guy went to Harvard. This guy has two Pulitzer Prizes. Like, of course he thinks O'Hare is shit, you know? <laughs> like, of course he's like this guy writing a fucking draft on a on a, on a ferry <laughs> and reading it at this fucking college with me. And how dare you kind of waste my time, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, people romanticize his kind of mental illness and shit like that. But he was, I mean, he was quite brilliant, but I think he put in a lot of work too. When you read about Lowell's stuff, you know, he has very complex rhyme schemes and he didn't just write those, you know, like O'Hare does on a ferry. He spent years, you know, mastering, editing out the rhyme schemes and things like that. Was he the one who was like going to have an affair with Elizabeth Bishop? He was in love just, with her. Yeah. And it just never really happened. She was Well, she was a lesbo. It was okay, speculate, <laughs> but yeah. She was in love with that Brazilian woman that she lived with who was like wealthy and she lived in Brazil, but they were very good friends because, I mean, I love Elizabeth Bishop. I think Elizabeth Bishop is one of the best American poets um, to ever live. She was absolutely fantastic, uh, but they were good friends and they would write back and forth in the letters. And if you, I think it because a book of their letters came out maybe 10, 15 years ago of mm -hmm. their letters back and forth. And I think it was very clear that eventually Lowell told her how much he was in love with her. But, you know, it was at a time where if you were gay, you couldn't openly be gay. So yeah. everybody just assumed you were straight. And yeah. so Lowell was just like, I'm in love with you. And she's like, well, I don't like dudes, <laughs> you know, like, sorry, like we're friends, but man. If I could only live with a rich Brazilian woman. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus she Christ. She gave her like, there was a movie about it. Wasn't there a movie about it? Uh, where that woman basically gave her like a little cabin on this like lake in Brazil. And that's where Bishop spent like most of her time writing. Mm -hmm. I think she had some family money too. Everybody did back then. You know, it's hard to be a writer without that back then. Yeah. But it does illustrate that divide, I think, between the academic and then the street for lack of a better word, kind of like the non-academic stuff where like some people will automatically reject a Frank O'Hare mm -hmm. or a Ginsburg or something because they're, because it is so liked, even a plath, it's so liked by what, for lack of a better term, layman, non, you know, degree yeah. holding or not PhDs in this shit. And uh, it's just an easy way to give yourself like an easy one up, you know, but <laughs> you know, turn your nose up on that. Yeah. When in reality, you know, a good scholar would appreciate all these different aspects of it instead of being like, huh, I'm not even going to waste my time with this. Whereas you could be saying, is he doing something interesting? Like Frank O'Hare clearly was. That's why he's canonized with all these other writers, but he wasn't quite like a Lowell. Yeah. I can see why Lowell hates it, but you know, you see this all the time that like you were, you and I were emailing and you were saying, you know, people that hate, don't hate on Ginsburg because I think, one, you know, you don't, it could be just because I don't like it, but it, I think it's mainly because there's this weird trend in literature and these kind of clicky things that happen in literature where, because that's Ginsburg and O'Hare and some of these others, Plath are like the first poets that people get into when they're just getting into poetry. Yeah. That therefore it's like, you know, passe or like uh, elementary. And like, uh -huh. if you have been educated, then you know better kind of thing just an easy kind of thing for you to make yourself feel better or superior or smarter or whatever it is. Do you and, think a lot of it too is they look at people like that as the people who ruined what like poetry should be? I think, yeah, there's some resentment to it. Sure. Yeah. Where yeah, like, it's like, there's the word yeah. I'm like, what word am I looking for here? Yeah. Resentment. Well, yeah, because and I think it's that same thing was, you know, it's that kind of turn up your nose. Like, how dare you? You know, how dare yeah. you? Know, I, I think that too, like people give Stephen King shit because he writes very quickly and he doesn't, you know, if he could, could he spend years working out all the little corny things of his novel? Sure. But that's just not the type of person he is. You know, it's not the type of writer he is. Yeah. 
and there's this kind of if I dislike or if I say I don't like a writer like Stephen King or something that I automatically get a little credit or a little bit of prestige in my own right, you know, yeah. with your group of friends or your yeah. MFA or PhD or something, whatever it is. So there is like a weird I mean, people do this like it's a jealousy is everywhere. You know, Hemingway talked about this all the time. Oh, with, fuck uh, yeah writers are incredibly jealous of one another and you have to you know you don't want to make that get out of control and you probably publicly don't want to do that because usually it makes you look bad well how do you think hemingway how do you think hemingway dealt with that because he got worse like as he was going you know like so where's the line with um like getting pissed off at everyone and getting like saying everyone's jealous of you Right. But like getting bad reviews of each book that comes out. Yeah. Uh, I think for somebody like him is clearly alcoholism and clearly depression and a bunch of other things. <clears throat> and I think people do underestimate the erectile dysfunction and shit like that towards the mm-hmm. end of his life where like that can make a man very angry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That could uh, make a man very angry not being able to do that. But it's like I think he devolved into alcohol. And if you saw even when he got his Nobel, like what is that? Ken Burns just did that big documentary on Hemingway. And there's a great scene when he got his Nobel and uh, he's giving the speech. He can barely speak. Like he's mm-hmm. had serious, maybe CTE or something like serious brain damage from all this boxing stuff yeah. that he did. Uh, so maybe he was getting some type of brain damage. Uh Maybe he was just devolving into alcoholism. And there's this belief, you know, among a lot of, you know, newer writers. And I think even in my MFA program, I saw a lot of writers that were like pretended to be alcoholics or wanted to be alcoholics because that's what they thought writers did, you know? Yeah. When in the reality of being an alcoholic is not fun. Like, it's no. Not fun and like, to, like, like, honestly, like I, I did, I don't remember when I did this, but I did this thing where I'm like, okay, look. This is how old Bukowski was when he died. Right. Okay. These are the years that he allegedly was not doing well. If you take everything Bukowski wrote and you took how many days were in this period, like that means like Bukowski's wild and crazy life was maybe two to three days a year. If you're fucking lucky. That's his most romanticized life. Cause that's like right. the biggest thing with Bukowski. Like, like the people, like people say the people who like Bukowski like Bukowski because they romanticize that and they want right. to like be the drunk that like beats people up and like womenizes and the whole fucking thing. Like the motherfucker lived to be like a thousand years old, right. you know, like if, if any of his shit was like legit, like that was seriously like maybe six weeks tops of him having a fun, crazy life. And the rest of his life was drab as shit, you know? Yeah. And there is something to that when you get older too, like in your twenties, you can live that lifestyle, you know, and then like in college and stuff. But then like when you start hitting 30 and then you're like, those the drinks hit heavy, you know, like they hit a little heavier than if when you're in your twenties and you can just wake up the next morning and like do your stuff. Yeah. 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 Even, even the big greats, like everyone famously Hemingway, the drunk, right? Like he claims he never wrote drunk. He would wake up in the morning, maybe hung over, but he would write, write as in the quick morning. as he could right. so he yeah. could go get drunk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but he knew that if he started drinking right away, yeah. the work would suffer. You yeah. can't be just like slathering yourself in alcohol and create the best stuff ever, you know. Unless you you're Faulkner. Be. Yeah, Faulkner. <laughs> and I bet I bet even he you know, would wake up in the morning and do most of it sober and then oh, maybe edit drunk God. later. You know, yeah. Joan Didion would say she would write in the morning and then when she'd fix herself a drink to read what she wrote that day, it does kind of separate yourself from yeah. the work. You get a little bit of distance. You can be a little bit fairer for your own stuff. Huh. Cause like, I like to write drunk and edit sober. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I like having that distance when I'm writing. Cause I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm more honest. And then like, the next day I'll look over it and go, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so this happened, huh? Oh, okay. That's yeah. great. Um, but like about Stephen King, like I think Stephen King's short stories are fucking fantastic. Like not when he's writing about sports, I don't know. Like those just don't do it for me, but his short stories I think are great. And then 
everything after the shining for the most part like i'm just like he's a paper salesman like he he's in the business of selling giant stacks of paper on giant pallets to bookstores you know like i i can't and it might just be like an adhd thing but like i just cannot like dig a big stephen king novel i can't do it and sometimes, you know, he's not the most refined writer. So sometimes the big fat ones meander a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. go off weird doubts. I always say King, you know, he's not a literary guy, but he's he's a story guy. Like I call King one of the most influential writers to ever live because everybody, despite even oh, if they, for sure. they hate him, they read a Stephen King book. Yeah. They saw a movie and they know him yeah. and they liked it <laughs> yeah. like kind of like. And he influenced the culture. Like Stephen King is like a, like you said, a business of himself. He's like his own industry. Yeah. He's putting a book or two a year and they're all bestsellers because he has the reputation now and all that. But uh, movies, TV shows, you can tell he cares. Yeah. He does care about the story and he wants to just give you a good little thrill. Like he's just, he always says in interviews, you know, I'm not a horror writer. I'm a suspense guy. Yeah. Whatever I have to do to make you feel suspense or thrill, is I'm going to put that in there. Mm-hmm. And I think it shows, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's categories, there's genres, but I mean, I love it all, man. You know, I don't like to just say, oh, I'm not going to touch a Stephen King book. Although in grad school, I knew many people that would like say that as a point of pride that like, I've never read. A oh Stephen yeah. King book. And I'm They're- like, well, He's one of the biggest writers in in the world. (laughs) You've never read any of his stuff. Yeah, for real. No, I know people who are like, if you say, if like in your top 10, you have a Stephen King book, like we can't talk, you know, like (laughs) and shit like that. And I'm just like, well, that's kind of. And you see, why do they do that? Right. (laughs) Why would somebody say that? They would say that one, it makes them feel good, right? It makes Uh them feel like they know something that everybody else doesn't, even though he's the most popular writer to ever live yeah like, oh i don't like the most popular guy to ever live like okay like <laughs> yeah you don't like that like oh yeah sure you don't uh, but there's that and then there's like i guess it's just like a way to weed out certain people because there are people that only read pop stuff just as there are people that only read literary stuff and sometimes when those worlds don't converge it is difficult to have a conversation so you know to be fair to somebody that would say that i understand the impulse mm-hmm. but i also would encourage them to be like you know are you saying that just to feel good about yourself or do you actually not like his writing you know yeah. like have you ever read it like <laughs> well like i don't know like how it was for you but like when i was growing up like at the grocery store there would be a book aisle you right? know that yeah. had books now, when you go to the grocery store, there might be an end cap, which is like, these are the like 10 best sellers, right? Yeah. You know, and that's all you got. And so for the majority of Americans, like if you're not reading those books, like you can't ever have a conversation about any kind right. of literature with anybody, you know, that's all there is. Cause like no one gets readers fucking digest anymore. Like you're right. not going to find that on the back of a toilet. Or I even like dated the, myself right there. Well, even like the magazines. Yeah. Playboy. Playboy used to publish King. Playboy yeah. used to publish Vonnegut. And like, you know, it was a men's magazine. Sure. And there would be like naked pictures. But like there were also like some great fucking stories. Like Vonnegut's yeah. first couple short stories are in there. King's first couple short stories. He sold to like nudie magazines. Like For one's real. not as big as Playboy. And they're really, even if you get like the Atlantic or something like their small little section of, of fiction and poetry, there's just, I, I that's why I do understand the lamenting that we've been talking about this whole time, where it's like, there isn't as much importance or like cultural significance to writing and poetry, whereas it used to be really cool. And I, maybe that's social media, maybe that's just the way we're changing, the way everything's changed, the way yeah. the media landscape has changed. But I think it also is, you know, literacy rates have gone down. We people are not reading as much. There's less people to talk to about books. You know, people like you and I, whenever we find somebody that wants to talk books, we're, oh yeah, you know, I'm very excited because it's so yeah, fucking yeah. rare. Like I'm like, where you know, where is everybody that wants to talk books? Where usually you could sit at a dinner table somewhere and probably people have read the bestsellers, but not you know anymore, what too? You know? I think I think there's like just a whole because like when i was in college like you can go to a coffee shop 
And like, I could be sitting there at a table reading the fucking bell jar and cover out someone walks by and he's like, Oh, you're reading the bell jar. Let's right. fucking chat. Now it's like, Oh, well I have my e-reader or my phone. You don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. I could be right. looking at this or fucking Twitter and like there's no conversation right you know but then again like who fucking goes outside anymore anyway like who's at a fucking cop right. <laughs> how, how do you feel about uh uh reading on a screen i like it i have way too many paperbacks like i i love vintage paperbacks right you know yeah. like i collect them and i'm trying to like actually weed a lot of my shit out right now um, because I move too much. And when like the majority of your U-Haul truck is boxes <laughs> that weigh like as much as a Volkswagen full of fucking books, like you want to kill yourself. But poetry does not, and you said it too, poetry does not work on an e-reader. You know, it just like, it hasn't the technology or, or just people not giving a shit to try to fix it have not made that work. And w- like one big example of this was um, I was reading a poem by, oh, what's their fucking name? I can't remember their name, but they had a poem up on um, Poetry Foundation and I was reading it on my phone during a podcast. And because of how the poem was set up on my phone, the enjambments were all fucked up. Right, and right, so I yeah. was putting emphasis on all these weird fucking words and I'm like, that sounds clunky as shit. And then I looked it up on my computer and it read a lot better. And it was just it like the body of the poem was completely fucking different. Right. So I haven't because I have a lot of books on Amazon that I get like ebook money from. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I don't put my poetry up there because it looks like shit. But I was like I did an episode a while ago about like um, people who read poetry, like what their habits are and everything like that. And like 75% of people are still, or not still, but are reading poetry digitally. And since most of the stuff I put out is like, like paper shit, I'm like, okay, I got to figure out a way to do this. So if I just do PDFs and sell PDFs, is that going to be okay? Yeah. But now I'm like killing my Amazon sales because like epub and dot mobies are a completely different beast um but it's annoying because i know that when someone reads my poem on a kindle it will not look the way i wrote it and i like do is that okay am i going to be okay with that so i don't know like that's my biggest bitch about it yeah i have resisted so far the uh the digital kind of crossover that's happening where everything is just kindle or you read on your phone i yeah. don't like reading on screens mainly because you know people that are readers if you're reading for a few hours a day well your eyes start hurting and i get kindles have settings and stuff so that doesn't happen but yeah dude, you know, the paper whites are fucking gorgeous and yeah. like it, they read so well like that like they don't hurt your eyes and the other thing about a fucking kindle dude uh, like a paper white you can take it in the shower. You could take it in the pool and they're yeah. fucking waterproof as long as you don't hold them underwater for like an hour, you know? And I'm like, Oh my God, I could read a book in a shower. Like right. sign me the fuck up. And like, honestly, I'm not trying to be a dick, but when I go to fucking Vegas, I like poolside bars, you know? Right. And like, I want to fucking swim up to a bar with my book and like sit at the bar, get drunk as shit and fucking read while I'm wet and not have to worry about dropping my book in the pool, which will right. fucking happen you know (laughs) yeah there's the tech aspect Uh of it and then there's just i mean there are studies that like we don't necessarily know why but your reading comprehension goes down when you're reading off a screen as opposed Mm -hmm. to like the standard paper yeah uh why we don't really know why some speculate that it's the blue light that interferes with like you know, we usually have to deal with that if we're reading on a book. I don't know. Maybe it's just the tradition of it that, like, for the last thousand years, uh, we've just read printed things. And now for the last 20, we've moved to digital kind of screens. I don't know. Just... I don't know what the science is called or what it, what the wording is. But, like, there's this thing where um, a lot of times when you're reading you'll re you'll be reading a sentence and then you'll just start putting the words together that you assume are going to come next 
Yeah. And th- like when you were talking about like when you edit your stuff, don't do it on a screen. Yeah. You yeah. know, like print it out. Like I've never printed something out to do it, but like I have to read it out loud. Yeah. You yeah. know, because if I don't read it out loud, that thing's going to be full of fucking errors. Right. But like when I'm go when my eyes are going over it, everything looks fine and normal. You know, and I don't know what the fuck that's called that your brain just like magically edit stuff for you so right. you don't have to worry about it you know but like yeah. it fucks up when you're trying to fucking put a book out i'll fucking tell you that i do i noticed this more and i do it in my creative stuff like i print out every draft when i'm going to edit it you know if i'm working on something i'll do it on the screen sure you know i'm not going to make it harder for myself but like I do notice, and I noticed this more when I was working in marketing, kind of right out of undergrad, and you know, just writing bullshit copy for marketing companies, yeah. as most English degree holders had to go through. <laughs> it's uh, like uh, when I was editing on the screen, typos, you know, cusp, comma splices, I just don't notice. And then if for some reason when it's in front of me, I can pick it out. Like I don't yeah. just gloss over it as much, and I don't know why, but that's. And I just say that too because it just you know even though your work you know when you're working on it isn't published and you know we don't it may seem grandiose to some that are trying to do this but like seeing it in the format that it's going to be printed in like in a Uh printed page white page like it does make it feel a little bit more real but also just kind of for me like encourages me to be like okay this is what it could look like like you know I'm doing it like it's happening. It might just be, it it might be too, like just having it be something different, you know? Cause like we're on our phones all the fucking time, texting motherfuckers doing the whole fucking thing. So like it becomes like second nature kind of shit. And if you printed something out and now you're fucking holding it, the whole thing is different. Just like if you go to a different place to do something that you do all the time, like when you go to that place, like it becomes a bigger deal you know that like that yeah. could be the same fucking thing yeah most definitely so oh, we didn't even get to berryman do we uh... no shit dude Fuck. <laughs> oh. so that was the inspiration right yeah yeah yeah. yeah. you were the first one to notice too really yeah. oh wow that's crazy no like when when i fucking read that poem the first time i felt like i got punched in the throat like and then i heard him read it And when I heard him read it, it like I was like kicked in the balls, punched in the teeth, the whole fucking thing. Like when he just fucking like he's so angry. Oh, yeah. And he's like, like I'm heavy bored. And just like the emphasis he puts on it, it's just like, fuck, man. Yeah, dude. Fuck yeah, Yeah. I am, dude. I'm fucking tired of reading shit I don't want to read because someone told me I had to fucking read it. Like, like the whole fucking thing, dude. I'm just like, (laughs) literature and then, like, bores me especially great literature yeah i'm just like <laughs> fuck, dude but then yeah. you have to get into the whole thing like um what's the fucking dude's name in it uh the henry. two the two other characters henry and um, mr bones mr bones yeah dude uh, it's like then i have to decide like am i really okay with this and i only have um the first 77 in a book like i don't have the complete Um, Do you think the complete is a better read? Uh, I think the complete is clearly the best, most innovative work of poetry we've had since. I don't think anybody's come close to doing what he did and actually succeeded in doing. Okay. Clearly drove himself crazy doing it. Um, I think Joyce did this as well with his last couple books, you know, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. I think you can tell these guys were so obsessed with doing something different, changing the way we think about the format, the way we think about the sonnet form in Berryman's case, you know, the form of the novel in Joyce's case, and even Joyce, the way we structure sentences, you know, yeah. <laughs> like the way he was fucking with that. But like, I think the fact that this guy, yeah, nothing's come close. I'll just leave it. Like nothing has come close. That is the most innovative book of poetry. And maybe that's when the death started, but like, where people were just not, how do you top that? How do you top what Berryman did with that book? Like, and people were pissed about it, right? Like he won the yeah. Pulitzer that year. People were pissed that he won the Pulitzer. And it's like, yeah, cause you didn't understand what he did, dude. Like read it out loud to yourself. Like this guy, like 
changed the fucking game forever and he's shit on now again usually for identitarian reasons you know like the trend right now yeah uh, some type of appropriation or something is usually uh because he uses uh i guess what you call like black english or like uh you know vernacular well, isn't like mr bones like a minstrel character yeah yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 and that's what they hit it with yeah that's what they hit it yeah. with. but if you read it you know i try to read it in a more positive light that it's a celebration of this beautiful sound english speaking sound yeah. you know which i you know i don't know what his motivations were for it i think he probably loved the sound of it too because it is beautiful like in a way and if you can harness that you know, some some do it great. Yeah. <laughs> some like them, yeah. I I see him as like a fucking mad scientist. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and like I have a lot of respect for people who are that fucking crazy. I don't I don't know how to make that not sound shitty, but like he was so intense about his fucking shit. Yeah, that like I don't know how anyone could like have a hard time with it or argue the validity of anything that he fucking did when he was that fucking just intense about it. Yeah. You know, like that's, I think it, it drove that's him. An I think that's what killed him. Yeah. I think it yeah. killed him. Like, and there is something to that. And I know some of your, a lot of your listeners probably know this, like when you're putting everything into a work of art that you're working on, that obsession, like it takes something from you. Like oh, it yeah. does there's a physical toll there's a mental toll and there's even like that depression that happens once you're done like kind yeah. of because it's over with and you're kind of wish you could go back into that little cocoon well, it's like you just broke up with a partner right. yeah, yeah you yeah. know like yeah. you spent time with this thing and now it's not there anymore and now all you have are the memories you had of the way you felt when you did that and then you're chasing it the whole rest <laughs> of your life it's like yeah. the whole heroin analogy like chasing the tiger right. or whatever you know but like that's why like the bloodshed review you know and the blood rag it's like writing to me is like slicing myself open and like bleeding out you know and like the paper absorbs what i fucking bleed it's like my band-aid you know and like i can't not feel like a lot of me is gone when that shits out and that's why I, I say a lot too like after i write a poem it's fucking dead to me because i just exercised it right you know and but like that doesn't mean i'm not gonna miss that right you know and like remember the good old days back when i had that you know but yeah, yeah. it's hard like that's i think everybody they think it's easy because you know it, it's sexy when it looks like you're not trying like people like you know professional sports like actors people that are really good you're like oh it looks so easy but like mm -hmm. it's fucking hard man like that's a lot of work that's a lot of rewrites that's a lot of years just being obsessed with this this sound you know dream song style like it just it takes something from me man and you can see it sometimes if there's a writer or a poet that put out a masterpiece and then they kind of it's like a peak right like they hit the yeah. peak of the mountain and then it kind of their work kind of declines a little bit like hemingway and still you were talking about like yeah because it takes something from you and i think maybe that's why people feel so personal about it when they're criticized and stuff because it yeah. is such a part of you it's some like someone regard. calling your kid right. ugly you know <laughs> <laughs> but like, and then that's the whole like Neil Young, Kurt Cobain thing, you know, like, is it better to burn out or fade away, you know? Yeah. And I think that's just like an artist thing. I, I don't know if there's other, I'm sure there's other walks of life where that whole thing rings true. I just don't know what the fuck they are. When you look at like coaching and stuff too, like we just, I mean, I, I always do with the sports analogies. Sorry, I know it's the wrong audience for it or not. But just like when you see these people that coach, you know, 70 years or something, these old guys that have been coaching yeah. college, same team, you know, 60 years or something. And then like, as soon as they stop, they basically, they're dead. You know, like, they're yeah. just, like that's the whole thing they were living for, you know? For real. Well, like and, I'm a big uh, um, professional wrestling nerd, you know? And so like oh, yeah, Ric yeah. Flair, like Flair is like the fucking legend and all be all motherfucker right greatest fucking wrestler ever and the motherfucker is like almost 80 
and he just had a fucking match last year and it was like the saddest fucking thing you've ever right. seen in yeah. your life and you know and he's like and now he's saying like maybe i have one more in me and it's like dude you almost had a heart attack in the fucking ring you were bleeding like a fucking pig you know and you didn't even really do anything and you were like huffing and puffing just right. walking to the ring but it's like if he doesn't have this what's he gonna fucking do right yeah you know that's the fucking yeah it's hell. having something and then the loss of it when you if you never had it then you can't miss it right but if you I, had it yeah i think that's gone. why i like, fear i fear like a stroke more oh, than yeah. anything like if i if my brain like I had COVID and then after COVID I had some like brain fog shit and I couldn't yeah. remember like just normal fucking things. And I couldn't like do math and I'm already bad at math, but like numbers were just like gone. I couldn't think of any numbers, but I started fucking panicking and I'm like, dude, if right. my brain's not working, like I, there's, I have no purpose. I'm done. Right. Like what, what's the point of fucking living? That's one of my biggest fears. Yeah. Oh. Alzheimer's or or something. Yeah. Yeah, As dude. King has said this. Stephen King has said this in interviews. That's one of his biggest fears, especially now that he's old. You know, he's almost 80. He's like, yeah. I, I think about it. Like, if I start losing it, like, that's everything to me. Like, because I don't have anything else. Like, yeah. me making up these stories in my head, these poems in my head is all I have. And then if you lose it, I guess if you don't know you're losing it, that's one thing. But like, well, if, if you don't know you're it, losing it, yeah. the stories in your head don't become stories. They right, become yeah. like your reality and you're like, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. And like Stephen King can't fucking like buy the van to destroy the van that run him over if what it's was, his fucking yeah. brain, you know? And what was that that movie that came out a couple of years ago with Anthony Hopkins, the father? It was about it was based on that play where like it's about the father that's like going through Alzheimer's and you see it from his perspective. Oh and he's fuck. like seeing these things, his daughter, he's confusing people and they're coming in and you're kind of disoriented watching the movie. I thought it was like basically a horror movie to me. I was like terrified. No, totally. Like, oh that God. sounds like, like <laughs> well, oh I mean, fuck, Anthony Hopkins is in it. So of course it's yeah. going to be a little terrifying. No, I haven't <laughs> seen that. That sounds fucking crazy, yeah. dude. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I'm going to have to check that out, dude. It's my biggest, one of my biggest is Alzheimer's or any type of memory loss. Yeah. yeah. And I maybe, you know, it happens. It Maybe it'll happen, but yeah, that's horrifying. Be like Berryman, just jump off a bridge. <laughs> oh man, that's <laughs> awful, dude. Yeah, they had to identify him by his glasses. That's fucking sad when like yeah. you're so fucked up that like your glasses are the identifying mark, but then it's like, how the fuck did you take a header and your glasses not shatter? And it like, was after all the success. It was after the prizes. It was well, I was after gonna ask getting you. the pussy. It was after all yeah. of that. Did and he... he couldn't yeah. So the first initial dream poems, did he win a Pulitzer for that? Or was it when yeah. it was all together? I think the the original 77, I think, got him the Pulitzer. Okay. I think, yeah. So do you think he was pissed that when he finished it, that it didn't get the same acclaim that the first one did? Mm, I, I could speculate. I think probably the alcoholism had most had the most to do with it. Yeah. And there there's speculation around his death where he was sober for about 11 months. You know, he got into a program and yeah. was sober for about 11 months, relapsed and 2 weeks later jumped off that bridge in Minnesota and that was the end of Berryman, you know. Yeah. So it could be that he just relapsed into some, you know, was just not thinking clearly and was in some dark place and decided that was the answer, you know, instead of putting it into writing, he could just jump off this bridge. I think there was some speculation about his girlfriend at the time too. Like he was notoriously kind of an ugly dude, uh, kind of like Bukowski, you know, he was uh -huh. kind of notoriously ugly, but uh, still got pussy because he was this great poet and stuff like that. And maybe there's something I think his girlfriend at the time like left him and she was much younger than him, of course. And, and yeah. things like that. And I don't know. I mean, I could only speculate, but yeah, I think there is something I think, you know, Brad Pitt said this when he got big, where he said, you know, you always want to, you want this thing. You want to be the big actor. You want to be the big writer, the, with the, get the Pulitzer, but then you get it and you still have to live with yourself. You know, <laughs> like he yeah. was like, oh, I got that. And actually it didn't make me that happy, you know? Like, yeah. No, like I still I've, have to I've deal been with chasing, my own. Yeah. Oh dude, I've been chasing that. Okay. Like, God, how old was I? I was probably like 18 
the first time a band I was in got on a record labels comp album. And that was like the biggest, like, I'm like, oh shit, like, this is it, man. This is it. And then I remember when the box, because everyone got copies of it. And so the box arrived with all the CDs in it. And I fucking opened the box and I pulled the disc out and I looked at it, took the shrink wrap off, pulled it out, looked at it, opened the little book, looked at it, put the CD in the CD player. And then I was like, now what do I do? Right. Yeah. Like now what, what, yeah. what the fuck do I do now? It was just right. like, and so I, I, that's probably why I'm as prolific as I am in so many different things that I've been in because like, I just, I, I don't want to like be stagnant and like yeah. that feeling, like, what do I do next is the worst fucking feeling in the world, dude. The, it's like Bill Maher says this, the comedian, I'm a Bill Maher fan. He does at least his show. And like, he does, he says this, like, why does he still tour? He doesn't have to tour every weekend. Uh-huh. You no, know, he's rich. He's old. He's got the reputation. He's got his yeah. show. Like he says, as soon as you stop, you're done. Like, he's like, as soon as I stop doing tour dates every weekend, I'll never be able to do it again. <laughs> like, kind yeah. of, or at least that's what he thinks, you know, for real. Like there no. is this kind of, yeah. What it's are you like, going to do next? Yeah. yeah. God, like, I don't know. Like I'm trying to come up with an analogy. Like um, imagine like waking up in the morning to take a piss and like you reach down your dick's not there anymore. It's like, where the fuck did my dick go? Like, how did this happen? Where's my dick? Like, and then it like, like, what do you do? You know, like, I don't, I don't know. Like it's compulsion, I guess is the best way to put it. But like, right. It's, it's crazy. Jack White said something too. He's the reason the white stripes even stopped making music. He said, you know, we reached a point. He's like, where I started getting depressed because I'm like, oh, you know, at first I was like, oh, if we just got a record label, oh, if we just got this, you know, yeah. and then I'd be like, oh, that's great. He's like, but then we got to a point. He's like, I have a band. We were playing 60,000 person stadiums every night. Like if I wanted to, uh-huh. and I'm just looking around going, why am I doing this? Like kind of, I want to do something else. And then he started all those weird side projects and yeah. the white stripes broke up and now he's solo doing 60,000 person stadiums. But still it's like even success, you know, it's great. It's, you should be happy for it when you get it, but it is, you know, it's not enough as a creator, you know, you, the creation is really what matters. The yeah. act of it, the That's, ritual of the it. The act like, is yeah. the art for yeah. sure. You know, yeah. and everything else is just gravy. Like if exactly, if you yeah, can, yeah. If you can do something from the art you make then that's amazing but like the art the making of the art is the thing that should be like pushing you to do stuff right. you know so fuck dude that's depressing as shit god we we got dark dude how the fuck did that happen it always everything, happens after everything was hours, going yeah. so good <laughs> the podcast world dude it's it's up and down you know? oh fuck that my friends is the end of this three part extravaganza with Andrew from heavy board. I hope you enjoyed it again. Go follow heavy board wherever you listen to your podcasts and let's get in to those, butt plugs, man, dude, I'm like rocking back and forth on the chair. Like I got something in me. Am I right? Jesus Christ, that's filthy. But plugs. So I want to give a big thank you to all of the people over there on Patreon. Michael, Cedar, Harry, Monse, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. And then for those of you in the YouTube thank you crew, I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia, to Lauren, and to Jason. You guys are awesome. And then for the big swinging schlongs over there in the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mitty, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Shaylin, to Tim G, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, to Adam, to Chase, to JH, and to Jessica. You guys are awesome. And then for the biggest of all the big thank yous, this goes over to the number one chappy over there in the chat book of the month club, Caitlin. Thank you so much. You're the shit. Hugs and kisses. Yeah. If you haven't yet, pick up my new chat book, Drinking Less, limited to 45 copies. The first 20 are signed. The rest are numbered. And each cover has its very own individual unique wine stain 
on the cover from a wine glass or a glass with wine on it, whichever you prefer. Um, so each one of these is a collector's item and one of a kind, okay? So go out and get that, or you could get the digital version on my Etsy shop as well, or you could just go over to YouTube and listen to the audiobook version if you'd like. Um, Bloodshed Review, Issue 2, with Mindy Simmonson, Bunny Wild, and Rich Boucher. This is out now. Go pick it up. Um, and you could get your I Hate Matt Wall sticker over on my Etsy shop as well. And if you want Poetic Anarchy Press or I Hate Matt Wall merch, get it down below on the YouTube video here. And if you are interested in, because I haven't really been talking about this, but I've gotten a couple gigs on it lately. So if you are interested in mentorship and you want to have like an hour with me where I go over what you do and kind of try to build your career or what's next for you, send me an email to ihatemountwallgmail.com and we will set up a time to do that. And I'm not 100% sure, but there should be sometime later this week, I think, a big poetry reading with hopefully Mindy Simmonson, Rich Boucher, Bunny Wild, and Shaylin Marks. And I'm going to try to do these like once a month, like these kind of bigger events and stuff like this um, and see how those go. And if this whole me doing audiobook versions of my poetry is going well, um, I'm going to be doing more and more of these. But probably what's going to end up happening is I'm going to do them and then they are going to be like live on my YouTube channel and then go to members only after a little bit. Um, the next episode of this will be with Mindy Simmonson talking about her book Skeletons. And then the following episode is going to be me talking about my old work and why it's important to not censor old takes I had that were shit. And also we're going to be talking about Terrence Hayes and a podcast called Breaking Form. So that's going to be something coming up. And then the following episode after that is going to be my interview with Dimitri Reyes talking about his new book, Pappy Pachon. Okay. So with that said, keep buying our books, everybody. Type hard. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.